Coming up next on Headline Humboldt, historian Jerry Rohde joins us to talk about Humboldt County's past, its present, and how he and his wife's new donation to Cal Poly Humboldt will help encourage a positive educational future. Also, after months of investigation, Humboldt County District Attorney Maggie Fleming clears local officers of wrongdoing in the September shooting death of David Chevrell. Coming up now on Headline Humboldt. Live from the top of Humboldt Hill, this is Headline Humboldt. I'm James Falk. Thanks for joining us. One of the instruments we use to locate ourselves on the continuum of human progress to judge whether we're part of societal evolution or an obstruction to evolution is history. Everything we do has almost certainly been done in the past with varying results. By referring back to what has gone before, we hope to avoid repeating old mistakes and perhaps take advantage of efficiencies that were used and identified by our forebearers. With the war in Ukraine, for example, with so many people have pointed to the last time such huge numbers of people in Europe were forced to evacuate and saw their beloved cities and institutions destroyed during World War II. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we recall the Spanish flu epidemic of the early 20th century and saw how our ancestors maneuvered to shorten the outbreak and save lives. Whether we've implemented those insights or not, we certainly knew more for having seen that example and could better predict how such problems resolve. Locally, when people want to understand where Humboldt County has been and by charting that course, where we are headed, people turn to one local expert in particular, Jerry Rohde. We here at Keat have partnered with Rohde numerous times in the past to gain valuable perspective on issues of the past and present and to learn as much as we can about our collective legacy. This week, however, he doubled down on his contributions to the study of local history by donating a large amount of money and material to Cal Poly Humboldt in order to preserve the stuff of history and ensure that the university will remain the center of such studies. He's here tonight to talk about his gift to the university, his work, and a new partnership with myself and Keat TV to produce a forthcoming podcast, Crossing the Bar, that will examine both the past and present of Humboldt County to get a better sense of where the future might lie. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. Well, thanks for having me, James. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show thanks. and in studio, especially now that COVID's yeah. perhaps settling down. Yeah. We're both vaccinated, so we're sans mask. But uh, so let's just start with, um, you've donated uh, what they say is the second largest donation to Cal Poly Humboldt ever. Mm -hmm. um, what do you wanna see done with that money? And uh, what, are you, what are your plans? Well, my wife and I are real specific in uh, what we, uh, the way we channel the money. And uh, almost all of it is going to go to pay for people to do work at the university. Mm -hmm. uh, if everything works out right, we'll fund permanently three staff positions at uh, Cal Poly Humboldt. Uh, one of them with the Osher Lifelong Learning Program, mm -hmm. uh, one of them with the uh, press that the library has, the press at Cal Poly Humboldt that prints uh, books of various types mm -hmm. and a third one with the special collections in the library which has all the uh, uh, resources uh, pertaining to local history and uh, related items like that. In yeah. addition uh, with any money that might be left over we will fund on a year-to-year -year basis uh, student assistant jobs uh -huh. for those different uh, areas also. Yeah. Uh, so the whole idea is that this is money that uh, we've made a commitment to give, but also the university's made a commitment back to us that will only be used for these purposes. And it's all about employing people. Yeah, and you mentioned before the show that that's in, in perpetuity. Like, that's yeah. those are going to be guaranteed positions from here on out. Yeah. I mean, one of the things about, you know, working at a school uh, or a university or anywhere these days, budget concerns. I mean, one yeah. year they're cutting off whole departments or you got to lose 10%, but this way those positions will be guaranteed into the future. Yeah, my wife Gisela experienced that at uh, Cal Poly uh, Humboldt. Of course, it was Humboldt State then. Yeah, but, uh, if we slip and say HSU, you know what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when she was there, it still was HSU working yeah. in the library. And uh, before she gained permanent status, she was a regular employee. But twice she was told that uh, she might uh, not have a job for the next year when the budget cuts came. Wow. And uh, you know that kind of uh, lack of assurance is pretty disruptive and not just to us personally but also it meant that here is a, 
or important job that wouldn't get done at the university. Yeah. And so part of our thinking here is if in the future there are budget problems like that, at least we know that some of these uh, jobs will be there for things that we consider really important to the community. Yeah, and that permanence could perhaps translate into keeping better people in those positions because yeah. people who are of value you know, want to have stability. Uh, now, all three of those things that you mentioned, you have a personal connection to, right? Yeah. So can we talk about that a little bit? How are you guys involved in the um, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute? Yeah, yeah this uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, they, it's called uh, OLLI mm -hmm. uh, for short. Here's one of their catalogs that they uh, put out. Uh, it's been on campus now for 16 years. Mm -hmm. It's uh, part of a nationwide program. There's over 100 OLLI programs at universities throughout the United States. And a philanthropist by the name of Bernard Osher started this program years and years ago and selected uh, universities to uh, offer classes for people who are 50 years old or older. Wow. And uh, it's open to anyone in the community and age group, and actually younger people can participate too, uh, but uh, the primary focus is on uh, older people. There's only 100 of those programs. Yeah, about 114, I think. And then yeah. we have one here in Humboldt County. We have one, and at first, uh, uh, the Osher Lifelong Learning Group was hesitant to try starting one. They looked at the demographics and they said, well, looks like it's a nice place, but uh, your population base is so small, we don't think that you can have 500 regular students every semester. Yeah. Uh, but we'll start, we're, okay, we, we think you at least are worth a chance. Yeah. So we'll start, and if you can make that 500, we'll keep you on as a program. Well, right away, we reached 500. 500. <laughs> and in three years' time, we reached 1,000. Wow. And uh, ever since then, at least up until COVID, we were over 1,000. And one year, we even reached 1,300. So we went wow. way beyond what they thought we could do. Yeah. And the community just responded. Uh, you know, we're an isolated area here. You can't just cruise down to the Bay Area sure. and you know, take a class there or go to a concert. It's not that easy. But yeah. here, they can just uh, do it right in their backyard and they have done it year after year. That's fantastic, and you've taught a lot of courses through them, right? Yeah, I've taught over 100 now. I teach wow. about three or two to three uh, each quarter. There's four quarters uh, that we offer programs. Do they overlap with regular academic quarters, or is there uh, a difference? Given? Well, we have a, a spring semester and a fall semester, and then we do a short month-long thing when the school is not in session uh, in the winter and in the summertime for regular students. Okay, okay. And now, uh, so what's your uh, money going to help Osher do? Just to uh, help it, bring Well, it's going to, uh, for one thing for sure, is <coughs> it will uh, pay for one staff person, uh, like we said, in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing because right now there is just one full-time staff person there, uh, and they have some part-time people. But this way we'll know that uh, they won't be as overworked as they are right now. Yeah, and, and then perhaps get more yeah. done, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Now, um, also, the uh, the library, you're, yeah. you, as you mentioned, your wife worked at yeah. the university for oh, 20 26 years. 26 years, I think, yeah. yeah. And uh, I also was in the library a lot because it's such a great resource for local history. Of course. And that's what I've been writing about for over 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, using the collection materials they had there is really important. And so another part of our bequest is going to go to fund another permanent staff position for someone who works under the special collections librarian. Yeah. And that means that they'll uh, be, uh, have enough staffing that they can uh, maintain the collection and add to it. And in fact, part of the agreement was that uh, they'll get all my collected papers uh, and be able to add those to their collection. Well, that's a significant part of your donation. It's not just the money. You're also giving them a lot of material that you've collected over the years? You know, 30 years worth so far and counting. And uh, in fact, uh, I recently did a book that uh, the press at uh, Cal Poly published and I had to do it all from home because of COVID. Yeah. I couldn't go into the library, couldn't just do it, but because I'd gone there so much in the past, I could just go to my files yeah. and I had everything I needed. That and the internet got me through a 161 page <laughs> publication. Now that's another thing is that the university's agreed to publish your work yeah. into the future. Yeah. Um, the one book that you brought with you is uh, a study of climate change on the northern part of the Bay yeah, Area. Yeah, it's there? a, it studies the section of Humboldt Bay between uh, Eureka and uh, Arcata where all the traffic is, a traffic corridor. Mm -hmm. And it was actually commissioned by Humboldt County because they wanted uh, information about the history of that area since it's going to be the first uh, location in Humboldt County to really be hit 
by sea level rise, mm -hmm. actually the whole bay, but that's a significant corridor that has to be considered. Yeah. Now, was that kind of a different thing for you? I mean, to uh, get commissioned by the county government to do something? Or? Well, I've done other reports for them in the past. Uh, with the McKay track, when they were going to acquire that, I did a history of that area and of the lumber company that was involved with that, the Occidental Mill. Yeah. And uh, then I did another one on the Hammond Railroad Bridge that they're trying to replace but don't have the funding for yet. So yeah. I've done you know, several projects for them. What do you, do? I mean, this is sort of off topic, but I'm fascinated by it. What do you do in that kind of situation? How do you begin to find the history of a place in order to tell, I mean, what's, what's your process? Well, you, uh, in the case of this uh, book uh, about Humboldt Bay, I had to define the territory, you know, mm -hmm. which was basically Eureka to Arcata and a couple of miles inland, like as far as Freshwater Corners and uh, Jacoby Creek. And so uh, Almost all of the writing I do is really geographically based. It's geographical history. Yeah. And so uh, my files are set up that way. So I just started going well, to all my convenient. files. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I go, I had a file for Arcata. I had a file for Bayside. I had a file for Indianola. And that gave me a starting point uh, to uh, write chapters about. Yeah. And then I would uh, pick up information. If I didn't have it right at hand, I could find a lot on the internet. And like I said, turned out I had enough that I could uh, cover everything in that case. Yeah. But, uh, and you know, other uh, researchers probably have their own way of doing things, but I, I think I kind of have a, a built-in advantage in terms of research because everything's so concrete. You know, I'm always looking at a place, and it's not like I'm studying a labor movement in Humboldt County or something that's a little more abstract. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I can look at photos, I can look at maps, I can uh, always have the material right out there. And yeah. that, that's my personal interest, but it also makes writing history pretty easy. And I think it'll make your collection valuable to the library, ultimately, and in an organized fashion that other people would be able to take advantage of, it sounds well, like. Hope so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you've uh, published a number of books, yeah. right? How many... Are uh, let's see, I think uh, this one that just came out is number eight. Okay. Yeah. And then you have number nine coming soon after, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm working on a series right now. I call it The History of Humboldt People and Places. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to cover all of the county. And I started in uh, 19, uh, or 2016 and came out with a book called Both Sides of the Bluff. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, the Lower Eel River Valley and Table Bluff. That was the bluff that yeah. was involved in the title. Yeah. And now I'm going, I'm doing a book on the Indians of Southern Humboldt County. And then there'll be two books on Southern Humboldt County uh, from about 1850 to the 1964 flood. Mm -hmm. And uh, both of those are in process. Uh, I'm basically finished the writing of them, but they have to be edited a little more. And then after that, I'll go out and do the north part of the county. Yeah. All in all, I think we'll have uh, seven or eight books by the time I'm done. Wow. So uh, can you give us an anecdote from uh, that, that book that would be interesting to share for folks? Oh, well, there's, you know, there's lots of I'm really sure there are. Exciting, <laughs> exciting anecdotes. But um, one of uh, my favorite is that uh, there's a spot uh, off the coast uh, down south of Ferndale called uh, Cape Mendocino. Mm -hmm. And it's noted for its winds. And just off the, the coast, there's a, a, a very hazardous part of the ocean uh, called Blunt's Reef. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a, a low area of shoals there and ships often would get caught on those shoals and have bad shipwrecks. And yeah. that was one of the reasons why they put a lighthouse on uh, Cape Mendocino. Well, there were many art uh, stories in the book about different ships, including one that was torpedoed during World War II uh, mm -hmm. by a Japanese submarine. But the story I think it was uh, really caught my attention was the time that there was a blimp wreck. Really? Uh, yeah, a, uh, there, it was uh, a Navy blimp that was coming up the coast and it was never quite explained, but the blimp suddenly lost altitude and landed in the ocean right next to the lighthouse. Wow. And uh, the whole crew abandoned ship yeah. and uh, they thought, oh, this thing's wrecked. And then when they got out of the thing, it took off <laughs> and started on its own. It just went up in the air, and uh, they called the, uh, the airport at McKinleyville and okay. said, can you follow this blimp for us? And wow, yeah. that is insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, what do you think, uh, in all your work, what do you think has been your most important contribution in terms of the study of history? Go ahead and take that mic. Oh. Your mic's having a little bit of a problem. Okay. There you go. Um, well, what I've tried to do in all the books is to uh, go back and find the uh, actual uh, 
sort of verbatim accounts were given about different events, incidents. Mm -hmm. In this book that I'm uh, writing about, the Southern Humboldt Indians, that meant going to the field notes of these early ethnographers, wow. where they were talking to the Indians and then writing down what they said. And I didn't want to just quote what the experts were saying about it, but I wanted to find sure. the actual words of these people. Yeah. And I tried doing that also with later history, but it was so powerful to go back and see uh, these little dime store notebooks that these ethnographers would write in, yeah. and then they'd be out walking with uh, some Indian who'd been here in 1850 when the whites arrived, and that wow. person would be uh, telling him, well, there was a village here, or these people were taken to the reservation and they all died, or here was a uh, rock shelter that people used to live in, and you just get little bits and pieces of history there within uh, something like 30 or 40 of these notebooks that I could look at. Yeah, yeah. And then and for the first time that I know of, uh, that material is going to be used and be made public. And so we're actually going to hear voices from 170 years ago. Yeah, and that's fascinating because it really, I think, strikes a chord of like, uh, I mean, it makes you realize how similar we are to those folks, even though they seem so far removed. Yeah. We're all just, you know, the same people today. We are. We're complicated. And, you know, what amazed me was that here Indians would be talking about villages that had been wiped out and horrible things had happened to them. But not once in those interviews does it come through that uh, they held hatred in their heart. They moved beyond that. And uh, I was just so impressed with that. It's a wonderful lesson that other people can learn yeah. from them, even though they suffered as much as any group of people ever have up here. Yeah. And for them to be able to turn that corner in their hearts and yeah. not have hard feelings about all of this. But well, you know, that's one thing that was really beautiful to watch. And we had done a project before on um, uh, Tolawat Island. Yeah. Um, but to see when the city deeded back the vast majority of the island and there was um, you know, a very powerful spirit in the air of forgiveness and reconciliation. And it was remarkable because you know the crimes that were committed. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to be able to move forward like that, I think, provided a model for, you know, a lot of native slash yeah. uh, governmental relations all over the country. Yeah. You know, and you were available to provide some valuable perspective on that. Yeah. yeah, and I just hope that some of the things I write can be used to enlighten people about what had happened in the past so more of those things can occur you know yeah. not just between whites and <clears throat> indians but between other groups like the chinese who were driven out of Humboldt absolutely County. Yeah. when you uh i mean do you often get consulted by outside outside people looking to find out about history in Humboldt yeah, County? yeah uh, and if so know, what are they interested in yeah so, well uh it depends there might be some topic you know at the time and uh, they were very interested in the name change at what used to be patrick's point state park mm -hmm. sumeg now uh one thing, when they were considering the wind farm up on Bear River Ridge, yeah, yeah. I, I had two phone calls. One was from a member of one of the local tribes, uh, hoping that I had some information about that area. And another was from a rancher in that area who mm -hmm. sort of had opposite concerns, but also wanted uh -huh. information. So they're both looking it. for data to back up their yeah. particular, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the power of history, right? Yeah. I mean, that just yeah. sort of shows you it's relevant no matter which side you're on. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, you know, so uh, we're running, we have about two minutes left. Mm -hmm. We're going to be launching a new podcast. It's called Crossing the Bar, which mm -hmm. is a reference to the notoriously difficult passage. Uh, and there was a book by John Humboldt Gates. Yeah. So we're, uh, yeah. you know, hat tip to mm -hmm. Mr. Gates. But um, it's uh, the, the title comes from Crossing the Bar, and that was a dangerous, you know, yeah. finding of the way. And uh, my idea for the podcast was to sort of talk about how we move from the past with all of our legacy industries of timber and fishing and um, those sorts of things and move into the future, um, what that's going to look like, how difficult that can be to make that transition, especially since things have changed so rapidly yeah. up here and the characters involved. Yeah. And you are going to pr provide our historical expertise on that in the yeah. next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It should yeah. be a lot of fun. Yeah, we've had one interview so far, and that was with uh, fisherman Ken Bates, who is a colorful character and a sort of a renaissance man. So yeah. I can't wait to yeah. hear what you have to say about that. But okay. uh, yeah. people stay tuned for that. Um, okay. Basically, that's all I had for you. I mean, I guess my last question Okay, uh, we have a minute and a half left or so. Uh, you know, what can we do as a society to help make the study of history a more present and, um, you know, pressing concern for folks? I mean, like, yeah. 
I think it's, it's by starting how. locally. Mm -hmm. And you know, I went through college and high school and had all these history classes, but it was almost always about a bunch of old guys that were fighting wars or rigging elections or something that wasn't right in our backyard, something that we couldn't go out and see and feel. Mm -hmm. And what I've tried to do and what other local authors have tried to do is to bring that home and to get people to go out and uh, look at the past that's right there, staring them in the face that they can connect to and learn the stories that are connected with these places. Yeah. If you do that, I think you start grasping the power of what history can bring to things. Yeah. And uh, it actually then is relevant to you and your community, and it's not just some assignment you have to complete to pass a class. You know, one thing that has always sort of perturbed me is that there's not a whole lot of local history offered in like high schools. You know, it drives like, me nuts. Yeah, it's yeah. like if there's really going to be a history that matters to local students, yeah. a lot of times you think it would be the cultural and, you know, all the details that form their own community. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had the opportunity to go talk to students? Oh yeah, I've talked to students. I've taught off and on and, you know, it's, to me, uh, local history or at least dealing with our past, the places of the past and what happened there mm -hmm. is just vitally important. But they don't teach you any of that. Uh, you know, my wife is a self-taught naturalist and she went out and learned to identify plants on her own yeah. because of her love of them. Yeah. And then her love of them increased the more she knew about them. Yeah, absolutely. And those are the ways that learning can be so positive, if I think, if they're related to the here and now, but also bringing you back to the past. But things you can see, feel, touch, look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, we have 30 seconds. If someone wants to buy some of your books, they yeah. can go to Amazon.com and search for Jerry Rohde. Yeah. And yeah. the HSU has a press page probably? Yeah, or? if you go to the HSU uh, library page, H uh, the Cal Poly. Cal Poly Humboldt. Yeah, <laughs> they have a downloadable version of uh, this. Uh, all the books I'm going to be doing with them are there, plus the local bookstores have them. Awesome. And the local bookstores' price is a lot cheaper than Amazon. So Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I should, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. my mistake. Uh, yeah. He's right. Go to, go to the <laughs> local bookstores. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. I appreciate your time, yeah. and we'll be Th talking Thanks soon. for having me. Thanks, right. James. Excellent. Uh, we'll be back after this short break. Excellent. This is a special cub chosen for life in the wild. But preparing a captive-born panda to roam free isn't easy. Little is known about wild panda life. Meet the dedicated team who spent years shedding light on the wild world this little panda will face. We're heading toward the ground at race car speeds. A planet millions of miles away. We get one chance, we have no opportunity to fix it, and it has to work the very first time. A mission to answer the ultimate question. You want to have a nice, pristine sample without any Earth contamination. Are we alone? The payoff is we could maybe bring back fossil Martian cells. Looking for life on Mars, on Nova. The COVID-19 pandemic response in Humboldt County is rapidly becoming an endemic response. And tonight at midnight, the state will lift its mask requirements for children in school. The state will continue to strongly recommend that students keep their masks on while indoors in public. The Humboldt County Office of Education has said in recent days that it will lift mask requirements, but that it's up to individual school districts to set their own standards. Excuse me. Both Eureka City Schools and the Fortuna Unified School District have said they will continue to recommend masking, while the Rio Dell Elementary School District has already voted to ditch the mask mandate. The total number of COVID cases recorded in Humboldt County is quickly approaching 20,000. After a months-long interagency investigation, Humboldt County District Attorney Maggie Fleming announced this week that the September officer-involved shooting and killing of 35-year-old David Chevrel was justified. The report states that, quote, the district attorney has concluded the shooting was legally justified in that the officer's actions complied with California Penal Code Section 835A. According to the report, once Chevrel pointed and fired his gun, the officer's reaction was a natural response. The officers reasonably believed 
they were in imminent danger of being killed or suffering great bodily injury, the report states. The September 9th shooting resulted after officers reportedly tried a number of methods to end the situation. Chevrel refused to comply a number of times and multiple officers testified that when hit with non-lethal pepper rounds, Chevrel pulled a gun and shot at the officers who then killed him. The Humble County Critical Incident Response Team that investigated the shooting consisted of officers from Eureka Police Department, the Humble County District Attorney's Office, the Humble County Sheriff's Office, Arcata Police Department, CHP, and the Ferndale Police Department. After the U.S. House of Representatives this week voted to ban Russian oil and apply further sanctions to Russia over the ongoing invasion of Ukraine, North Coast Congressman Jared Huffman issued a statement supporting the move. House passes legislation to ban Russian oil is what his press release was headlined. We will not subsidize Putin's unprovoked, unjustified war on Ukraine, he said, and that includes importing Russian gas and oil. President Biden has shown us his commitment to holding Putin accountable with escalating sanctions, and Congress has swiftly moved to shore up these actions with today's bill, further isolating Russia from the world and leaving it weakened strategically, economically, and diplomatically, Huffman said. Quote, defending freedom has costs, but this doesn't have to be a choice between standing up for democracy and protecting economic interests. He pointed out that Congress will work to ensure the stability of global oil markets, to diversify the, natural ener the national energy supply, and to prevent companies from exploiting this crisis by price gouging Americans. The ultimate solution, he said, would be to hit Putin where it hurts by weaning our economy off of fossil fuels. This week, the California Energy Commission approved a $10.5 million grant for renovations at the port of Humble Bay to support offshore wind projects on the North Coast. Once renovated, the new Humble Bay offshore wind heavy lift marine terminal will be capable of handling large heavy cargo vessels, offshore wind floating platform development, and other maritime activities. By investing in offshore wind port infrastructure, the Commission hopes to expand opportunity for offshore wind development in California, which is home to some of the best offshore wind resources in the entire world. The terminal is expected to initially support the development of up to 1.6 gigawatts of offshore wind in the Humboldt County Call area. That's enough electricity to power up to 1.6 million California homes. According to the Commission, the project is expected to revitalize the waterfront industry in Humboldt County and provide living wage jobs to nearby communities. An economic assessment found that the terminal could generate as many as 830 local jobs and more than $130 million in industry output over a five-year period. So this has been pledge season this week. I don't know if you guys have been watching, but our shows have been, uh, you know, sort of hit and miss because we've had special programs on the air that are a treat for our viewers and for our members. The purpose, of course, is to entice folks, uh, the people who watch Keat, to become members if they're not members or to uh, up their gift if they are giving, you know, a, a gift now and give a little bit more. So if you can, please support Keat. Uh, the number on your screen, I think, can tell you which number to call and uh, mention Headline Humboldt because we always like to get credit here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Stay tuned. Stay informed.